On today's episode of Hello Road, let's talk about some of the weird, obscure, and forgotten cars from the 80s and 90s. Are any of them still on the road? Let's find out. Now it's time for a montage. Hey everybody, Ethan here. Welcome to Hello Road. Many of you know that I'm a huge fan of the cars from the 80s and 90s, and especially the weird, forgotten, and unloved cars from the era. I'm particularly interested in cars that just didn't sell well, or were too weird for the buying public, or suffered from bad marketing, or maybe weren't all that well built, or were considered disposable and got junked when repair bills got too high. Vehicles that decades later are a rare sight to see. Can we find any of these forgotten cars for sale or are they all lost to history? Let's fire up our web browsers and see what we can uncover. Mitsubishi brings the turbo age down to earth. The new Cordia Turbo. Remember the Mitsubishi Cordia Turbo? I didn't remember it either. I totally forgot about this car. This boxy and slightly odd thing screams of early 80s styling, and I love the way this thing looks. The Cordia is the lesser known smaller sibling to the far more expensive Starion, and was sold at a time when Mitsubishi was little known in the States. The Cordia was one of the first Mitsubishi branded vehicles that was sold in the US without the assistance of Chrysler, which owned a stake in the company. This front wheel drive compact hatchback coupe went up against the likes of the Toyota AE86, the Nissan 200SX, the Volkswagen Scirocco, among others. But as you might have guessed, in the US, just about no one bought these things. They sold just under 48,000 vehicles in the 83 to 88 model years in the States. Apparently, they sold better in Europe and Australia. A few Cordias were even used as police pursuit cars in Australia. Depending on the market, a number of different engines were used in the base Cordia, and the Cordia L and LS could be had with a strange eight-speed super shift dual mode manual gearbox. But the turbo, that's the one that I'm interested in. The early 80s was a hotbed of turbocharged motors. It seems like just about every manufacturer was getting in on the forced induction trend to boost horsepower and performance from their small engines. And Mitsubishi fully embraced this trend and added turbos across their lineup of cars and trucks. In the US, the Cordia Turbo had a 1.8 liter turbocharged single overhead cam four cylinder motor making 116 horsepower. Back in the day, Road & Track said it was their quote, favorite affordable sports coupe turbo engine. The car was lightweight and zero to 60 miles per hour occurred in just about nine seconds, not too bad for the era. It had independent suspension front and rear, so handling wasn't too bad. Can we find one for sale? I grew up in the 90s and I don't remember ever seeing one of these things. Seems like they must have all disappeared from American streets by the 90s. Let's see what we can come up with. Of course there's nothing here. We can try Craigslist, but not gonna come up with anything. Nope, 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 nope. Let's try Google. Here's one that was for sale in 2014. This is a 30,000 mile 1984 Mitsubishi Cordia on Bring a Trailer. Big fan of the two-tone paint on this thing. Those wheels are totally rad. So there was at least one still on the road in the United States in 2014. I wonder if this one's still on the road. Okay, so I'm having no luck finding one in the United States. Let's see if we can find one internationally. This was uh, in 2019. This one was in Australia. Very nice. $19,500. If you want a Cordia, there's like none available. So maybe that's the price you gotta pay. I wonder if it sold for that. Here's one in Belgium. This one is available for just under 5,000 euros. So this is a GSL. It's not the turbo that I was interested in, but look at that interior. That looks awesome. These stripes, that steering wheel looks so rad. Okay, here's a few more. Okay, this one is in Norway. Check out that hood scoop. This is a turbo. So they're out there. Okay, I'm, I'm really excited about this one. It's got the 1.6 liter. That's really cool. Exciting. If you want a Cordia, you're pretty much SOL if you're in the States, but head over to Europe and there's a few available still. All right, off to the next one. It's time for something adorable and fun and weird. It's time for the Suzuki X90. What is this ridiculous vehicle? Introducing the new 4x4 X90 from Suzuki. It's gonna make the 90s a lot more fun. The X90 is a two-door, two-passenger, open-roof mini SUV. 
But even that isn't a complete description. This thing, even today, defies categorization. It's like they made it a Honda Del Sol with a Suzuki sidekick. Designed and created in the heyday of the X Games, the whole purpose of this car seems to be an attempt to appeal to Gen X buyers. Heck, even X is in the name. Gen Xers want to be different, right? So Suzuki went all in. Is it an SUV? Is it a sports car? Is it a lifted coupe? It's all of them. The 90s are ever present on the interior with the anything but subtle splash design fabric. Even Red Bull used this as the basis for some of their rolling advertisements. The X90 had good ground clearance and it was available in either two or four wheel drive. The 4x4 version was actually decently capable off-road. The 1.6 liter four cylinder made just 95 horsepower, but it wasn't terribly slow. Zero to 60 was just a hair over 10 seconds. But unsurprisingly, the X90 sold very poorly. It was a car that was impossible to categorize and humans tend to dislike things that they can't easily slap a label on. But also, it was probably an example of a car that was trying to be too many things at once. And perhaps it was just a bit too expensive. Compared to the similarly priced RAV4 and CRV that offered more utility, the X90 wasn't able to make a decent value proposition. Jeremy Clarkson said, there are almost no occasions where the X90 is suitable. That might actually be true. But this is truly a car for people who didn't care about what was suitable. They wanted something radically different. They maybe didn't care that it didn't fit into traditional categorization. But that meant only a handful were sold and it only lasted in the States from 1995 to 1997. Some thought this would actually be a popular segment. Even Car and Driver thought it would be the quote, next big thing. But it proved to be far too wacky for the buying public. But I give Suzuki a ton of credit for trying something different. I would love to see if any of these little strange SUVs are still available. Can we find one? Oh, there's three. This is exciting. We found three already. All right, this one is $6,800. Look at that thing. It's just so ridiculous. Let's take a look at this silver one. This one's $4,000. It's kind of more in line with what I might want to pay for one of these things. This one also looks like it's in really great shape. These headrests are just so silly. I love them. I think I want to buy this thing. Oh, there's one in California. Seven grand, a little bit more than I want to pay, but look at this woman. She looks so happy driving this thing. You can't not have a smile when you're driving around in this thing. You love this car so much. Why are you selling it? I don't think you should be selling this. I think you should keep it. Delete your listing. Here's another one near Chicago. Overall, it looks like it's in pretty good shape. $2,500. They only brought like 7,000 of these to the US. So I think that's a pretty good deal if this thing is running and driving. We gotta look at this one. Oh, reduced price. I wonder why the price is reduced for this car. Any ideas of what might make people not wanna buy this? I mean, I'm not gonna make fun of anybody's car. If you wanna add eyelashes to your car, that's totally fine. But if I bought this X90, I'd probably take off the eyelashes. So $4,500, that's not bad. So if you want an X90, there's way more of them available than I thought there would be. Might have to get one for myself. All right, off to the next one. Next up is a car from a dead brand a brand that only lasted from 1985 to 1989. That brand is Mercur, and the car is the XR4 Ti. Mercur XR4 Ti from Germany. Back in the early 80s, Ford executives saw the growing trend of yuppies buying BMWs and wanted a piece of that market. In the States, Ford didn't have the vehicle to compete, so they looked to their European portfolio. They chose the Euromarket Ford Sierra XR4i as the vehicle to import to the US. But company executives didn't think that the Ford, Mercury, or Lincoln brand names had the cachet to compete with BMW. So they chose to create an entirely new brand to break into this market. They called it Mercur, or German for Mercury. The styling is mid 80s cool with body cladding, biplane spoiler, and slightly strange recessed headlights. The European Sierra had a 2.8 liter V6, but for the US market, we got a 2.3 liter Turbo 4, also found in the Turbo Mustangs and Thunderbirds. Five-speed manual cars got 170 horsepower, auto cars got 140. Zero to 60 was about eight seconds for both cars, very good for the era. With rear wheel drive and independent suspension front and rear, handling and ride were pretty decent for the era. Early reviews were positive. The XR4 Ti received Car and Driver's 10 Best Award in 1985, though they later said it was an embarrassing choice. 
Even though the car suffered from some early reliability problems, I don't think car and driver needed to backtrack as far as they did. Sure, the XR4 Ti didn't quite have the refinement to compete with the BMWs of the day, but it was a decently fun car with decent handling. I think Ford expected yuppies to flock to a German sounding brand name and lap it up, but they didn't. Sales never met Ford's expectations. Not only was the name Mercur weird and oddly similar to Mercury, it didn't mean anything to buyers. BMW and Mercedes brand names had history and deep-rooted identities. Mercur had none of that. Even back in the day, I wondered why the heck Ford didn't just call this XR4 Ti a Ford. Instead, they went through the trouble of trying to invent a new brand identity, having to educate any potential buyer what the heck this new brand was supposed to stand for. Pricing was certainly an issue. Lincoln Mercury dealers may not have been too excited about selling Mercurs since the margins were much thinner than their other offerings. The XR4 Ti was a decently fun car that was appreciated by some and today has its share of fans, including myself. No, the XR4 Ti may not have been quite as good as the BMWs of the era, but I don't think that's the reason why it was forgotten. I think the reason why it was forgotten is because it suffered a series of marketing, branding, and pricing missteps that put it at a disadvantage. At least that's my opinion. Let's see if we can find one for sale. All right, not looking good so far. Let's check Craigslist. Nothing so far. I thought there might be more of these things. Where did they all go? All right, so Bring a Trailer has had seven of these for sale over the last four or five years. Most recently, one sold for $4,000 in 2019. Seems like in the last five years, the price has been hovering around five grand. This blue one looks pretty rad. Let's see if we can find anything else. Here's one that was for sale in 2019. That one looks really nice. Wow, that's in great condition. Seven grand. Okay, here's one that was sold for $3,000. It looks like last year. They do come up for sale on occasion, but just not that regularly. So no luck for me today. Let's try the next one. Let's now shift to a mostly forgotten SUV, but one that I would consider completely underrated. I'm talking about the Isuzu Viacross. Isuzu Viacross, theoretically, is still a truck. The Viacross was Isuzu's design vision of the future. And this athletic, funky two-door SUV looks relatively modern today. Back in the 90s, the SUV market was growing rapidly. However, they were mostly all boxes on wheels. Isuzu aimed to change that and stunned the automotive industry with a futuristic Viacross concept in 1993. Unlike many concept cars, not much changed from concept to production. Okay, so the name Viacross, maybe that didn't age very well. It's kind of dumb, especially the Viacross logo, which is decidedly stuck in the 90s. But aside from the name, this is one fantastic, well-executed car. It's a highly capable off-roader with fun-to-drive on-road characteristics. At the time of production, it had some of the most sophisticated shocks available, made with aerospace-grade aluminum. Isuzu's torque-on-demand, full-time all-wheel drive system received high praise. Performance was decent for the era. The 3.5 liter 24 valve V6 made 215 horsepower with a zero to 60 time in the nine second range. The styling certainly didn't appeal to everyone, but the great thing about being a limited run vehicle is that it didn't have to. I really like this car, but I've always called it the shoe car. It literally looks like a running shoe to me. Even Isuzu called it the sport ute equivalent of a cross trainer shoe. There's a ton of body cladding, typical for the era, but it doesn't look bad here. Interestingly, Isuzu planned for this to be a limited run SUV from the start, probably because they knew not many people would buy something this weird. Isuzu employed innovative development and manufacturing techniques to shorten the development cycle. They had created a whole new system to build limited run niche cars. They also cut a few corners. They went with the off the shelf Isuzu Rodeo interior, which didn't quite match the weird exterior, but shortened the time to market. Sold in the US between 1999 and 2001, only 4,153 were imported to the US and just under 6,000 total built. At the time, there was really no other vehicle like it. Even today, there's really no other vehicle like it. Ultimately, it was an experiment that paid off in some ways and didn't in others. They sold all of the cars they intended to build, but you'll notice that Isuzu never made another limited production car for the US, and they left the US market entirely in 2009. Let's see if we can find one. All right, here's a few. This is the 1999 for almost $11,000. It's in pretty good shape. I mean, these things are incredibly rare. Do you think 10 grand is a good value for something like this? Let's take a look at the one on eBay. 
Yeah, the paint is pretty rough. Seen better days. The body cladding is all faded. So I wonder what the reserve is on this. What do you think? Let's check Craigslist. Okay, here's one in Phoenix. This one is $4,500. Okay, here's a couple more. $6,500, this is a 2001. Looks like it's in pretty good shape. The green color is really nice. Here's another one in Nashville. This one's only $5,000, 130,000 miles on it. It's got a couple of small issues, but it seems like with all of these, that plastic body cladding did not age very well. Here's another one. This one's seven grand. So I'm actually kind of surprised at how many of these are available. I mean, I guess it makes sense because they were a limited run vehicle and people that bought these cars probably knew that they were rare, so they were less likely to end up in a junkyard. So if you find yourself desiring a Viacross, there's quite a few available. So would you ever consider buying one of these forgotten cars if you could find one? Which one do you think I should put on my wish list? I'm kind of thinking the Suzuki X90. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. I'll have more videos with my collection of 80s and 90s cars, reviews of new and used cars, and road trips to unique locations. And of course, more videos where we look back at the rad cars of the past. Are there any cars you'd like to see me feature? Let me know in the comments. All right, see you soon.